My name is Carmen Papalia, and I'm an artist that works in various disciplines. Thanks, Rick. For Live Biennial this year, I developed a non-visual walk um, around the pond at Hastings Park. So you, do they keep their eyes shut? I tell them. Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> they tell me, I usually say they have to tell me if they open them, and, and they do. He engages the public in a politicized conversation about ableism. I find the work very exciting. I walked this route um, multiple times uh, prior to uh, leading the walk itself, and that, that's usually my process, is I'll walk a route until I feel comfortable bringing a group of people with me. Some of what I'm looking for are landmarks that I can use to orient myself just on this path. Okay, so grass means no go. Nice. I think a lot of my work really is about uh, questioning the privileging of the visual sense. I've been doing this series of performances where I replace my cane with various things and then try to navigate um, an unfamiliar place. I hear someone in front of me. Uh, I'm visually impaired and I'm, I don't have a, a mobility device right now. I'm using my voice. Um, I can't see you. I can't see you. It is a very vulnerable uh, sort of situation because using the megaphone, I'm saying, I can't see you. I hope you can see me. Uh, I hope I don't bump into you. It's a really a different way to like uh, approach my, my own mobility as like a creative process. I'm wondering if there's anyone around that can tell me if it's clear. Oh, it, it's definitely not clear. Oh no, okay. Um, Maybe when it gets quieter. At a point in time, I stopped using the word blind and visually impaired to describe myself. I really felt like those words really still privileged the visual. You know, the idea is that like seeing is believing, uh, seeing is connected to knowledge and one's understanding um, or, or, you know, sense of the world around them. So, you know, using the word blind to describe myself, it's almost like I'm introducing myself to someone as someone who's unaware. And uh, I just didn't think that really described my experience. Hey, baby. Hey. Yeah, now as Pearl's starting to walk, I wonder when she might be able to go on a walk too. I'm gonna lead a walk with her in the carrier. Uh huh. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah. That would be cool. Carmen does this thing at the end of his walks, and he go, he'll go, one, two, three. Open your eyes, and then people open their eyes, and it is like, it's like they've just like seen something really cool or like the face people get when they like look at fireworks and they see them and they're like oh, or something it's like all of a sudden as soon as they well first close their eyes but then when they open their eyes it's like they've been through something okay so this is um a walk that i've been leading since 2010 uh I think of it as exercise for our non-visual senses. So uh, I don't really think of it as like a walk in my shoes because I, there's a lot about my experience that I can't really share or translate for you. So yeah, I think of myself as someone who uses their non-visual senses as a way of knowing my surroundings. So I hope today we can dedicate ourselves to that experience and really try to use our non-visual senses to orient ourselves. Okay, I'm gonna start. So everybody, acquaint yourselves with your partner, link arms and shut your eyes. Okay, and we're starting. And we're starting. I know sometimes that it can get overwhelming for folks in the first half of the walk because they're having to contend with all this, you know, sensory information that usually is in the background. Oh, oh. Shrubs on the left, shrubs. Shrubs on the left, shrubs. Shrub. 
part of, part of the walk too is really about like a group of people coming together and then the system of support coalescing. Experiencing a place non-visually, it, it kind of allows us to become aware of the, the different dimensions of a place. Like we're often just focusing on one dimension of, of a place, but there, there is so much to, yeah, to notice or to be curious about um, in, in sort of a sensory way. You really, I mean, you're thinking about like your connection to um, what's underfoot. Um, you're, you know, you're feeling the wind on you. I notice this kind of like more of a willingness to reach out and touch something. And uh, it was like really this grounding experience that helped folks like anchor themselves in the environment. As I closed my eyes, I kept on seeing colors, but they were always sort of in the periphery, like intense colors. And as soon as I would say, like I would see a, an electric blue, um, and as soon as I would focus on the blue, it would start to fade, um, but it, it was there. And, and like, I don't really see color like that. By the end of the walk, I think there's this general sense of, you know, accomplishment. Like people have learned how to do something in a new way um, that they had never done before and are just happy to <laughs> open their eyes and realize that we hadn't lost anybody. <laughs> One of the great things of performance art is that there's the event and the people that participate in the event or the audience of the event. And then there's kind of a trickle down after that that event exists through storytelling and through memory, and that in a way becomes the artwork. We, we live in a very visual culture, and uh, I think, you know, I established these opportunities for people to come together and like develop or exercise their non-visual senses. I think some people get to the point where they want to continue practicing. And that's, that's like my hope, is that I can introduce people to a space that they would want to return to.